Welcome to Mr. Money Invest, where we talk everything about the market to help you better understand how your money is doing. So, what's in store for us in 2023? Before we go into that, it's very important to look at what happened in 2022 to help us to get a very good snapshot of how 2023 is going to pan out. As we all know, 2022 started off as a very bad year. We started off with a very bad geopolitical tension between Russia and Ukraine. And on top of that, we also have geopolitical tension between China and Taiwan as well. So what happened subsequently is that it triggered into an energy crisis whereby as we can see European was suffering from a lack of oil and gas. They have to go through a very cold winter and that shot up oil and gas prices to the roof. Even though it has came off a little bit, it is still at a pretty high level currently. On top of that, in 2022, we also experienced a very bad supply chain issue as we can see from the global chip supply and also ultimately even our food prices also experience supply chain constraint. That is partly due to the geopolitical tension that was happening between Ukraine and uh, Russia as well. And apart from that, in the US, after more than one decade of quantitative easing, they finally decided to unwind those cheap money in the market and they have been starting to increase their interest rate as well. You know, in the span of 12 months, the Fed has already increased the interest rate by six times and that has effectively increased the interest rate from nearly 0% all the way up to 4.5% currently. And the Fed is not going to stop there. Now they have a terminal rate expectation of about 5.1% but the market is expecting expecting them to increase the interest rate even higher if inflation is still stubbornly high. Now, all that come to a summary is that in 2023, inflation is still a very big part of the investment team. This is because even though there is a sign of slowing inflation in the market, the Fed is not going to slow down the pace of rate hikes in order to be very, very sure that inflation is being brought down. So with that in mind, how is Malaysia market going to look like in 2023? Let me show you the next chart below. These are a compilation of newspaper that draws out all these uh, research report from investors banks to talk about their year-end target in 2023. Interestingly, if you look here, MIDF Research is talking about a year-end target of 1,007. They are not alone. TA Securities is also giving a similar target of 1,007 by end of 2023. Now, if you look at slightly bigger banks like CIMB and RHB, generally they are a little bit more conservative but not too far off from 1,007. CIMB is talking about 1,633 and RHB is talking about 1,660 by end of 2023. And even more interesting is this. There's an outlier research in the market which is coming from Rakuten Research. They are seeing that by the end of 2023, the market could be hitting a whooping 1,800 points for 2023. Now, what does this number mean, right? At the end of 2022, the KLCI index ended at around 1,495 points. Now, if you take the median of all this compilation that I've made, which is 1,007 by end 2023, from 1,495 all the way to 1,007, this is a whooping 13.5 to 14% gap, which means to say all these analysts are expecting the corporate profitability to improve by 13 and a half to 14% for 2023. Now, is that even possible or not? With that, I want to show you another research report from a global fund management house called BlackRock to try to gauge and see whether all these um, local analysts forecast it is achievable or is it a very sky-high kind of uh, assumption. So if you look at the BlackRock analyst report, they are saying that the four decade period of largely stable economic activity and inflation is behind us, which means to say it is very likely that we are not going to see the typical economic theories to play out in 2023. This new regime of greater macro and market volatility is playing out. And with that, a recession is foretold 
and central banks are on course to over tighten policy as they seek to tame inflation. Now, all these are very, very big words used by professional. But what do they really mean? Let me try to illustrate to you in a simple illustration to help you understand what they are trying to say. This time round, the situation is very different. When we talk about an impending recession that could happen in 2023, the Fed is going to continue to increase interest rate, right? Why? Because they want to be very, very certain that whatever money policy that they put in place is going to tame inflation once and for all, maybe let's say five to 10 years, right? So even if a recession is coming, the Fed is going to keep the interest rate high, which means to say that the borrowing cost is going to be expensive. So what happens when borrowing costs become very high is that as an individual, I may not want to spend money, right? Because to borrow money from the bank is very expensive. So I am not going to spend. For businesses, it's the same situation as well. If the bank tells you that to borrow money today as a business, it's going to be around 5 to 6% interest. But the project that you're working on that needs this borrowing is also going to fetch in around 5 to 6% margin. So at the end of the day, you make 5 to 6% margin over here, but all this 5 to 6% margin is going to be paid to the bank as an interest. So what for do this kind of business that brings no real profit back to the business, right? Therefore, it's very likely that businesses will slow down their expansion plan as well. At the government level, the situation is also going to be the same. When interest rate is high, the bond yield that they are going to get is also very high, which means to say their borrowing cost will also increase. So therefore, as a government, they may not borrow money to build all these infrastructures that is less multiplier effect in the economy Economy, and therefore, we can kiss goodbye to all these initiatives to keep the economy engine running. When nobody is borrowing from the banks, that means to say that the economy is not running, right? When economy is not running, how do you expect the recession condition is going to improve? It's more likely that the economy will go bust. And that is the situation that we may be looking at in 2023 based on the BlackRock report. But with all this gloomy situation that is painted by BlackRock, so does it mean that in 2023 we shouldn't invest anymore? Now, what I think is that investment is still the way to build your wealth, but what we have to do is to find pockets of growth within this gloomy situation to help us maneuver in this very difficult situation. And with that, I've come up with an investment team that consists of 3Ds, and I'm going to share these 3Ds with you today. In 2023, everyone is talking about ESG, right? We have to be environmentally friendly, we have to improve our governance, and we have to be socially responsible with our investment as well. So one of the areas that we could look at for 2023 is actually decarbonization. Apart from that, remember we talked about geopolitical tension earlier whereby all these countries are fighting with each other. What they're actually trying to do is to bring back all this overseas manufacturing back to their homeland so that they can be self-sufficient and they do not rely on overseas supplies. And that means their overseas competitors or the other superpowers in the world will not hold them in ransom to say that, you know, if you don't comply with my policy, therefore I can ask this company not to supply certain materials to you anymore going forward. So therefore, the next team for 2023 will be deglobalization. So I've talked to you about decarbonization and deglobalization. The third major theme for 2023 is defensive. Why? Since the Fed is going to increase interest rate until something breaks, so we can sort of guess that something is going to break in 2023, but we don't know what is going to break. Now, since we, there are so much uncertainties in the market, it's best to be defensive. Therefore, this becomes the three major investment team that I think that every investor should be keep an eye on in 2023. What does it mean to be defensive? Now, if you do a quick search on Google, Google says that a defensive stock refers to a company that has very steady and reliable earning stream. That is number one. And second most important thing is it must have a very strong balance sheet. Now, what does it mean by having a steady and reliable earnings and strong balance sheet? Let me give you a very classic example to help you understand what a defensive stock comprise. Now, the most classic example to talk about a defensive stock is no other than Nestle. But when we talk about Nestle today, it's not about their international business. 
Why? Because Nestle is a multinational company, right? So it is very easy to get confused whether we are talking about Nestle in Australia or Nestle in Switzerland or is it Nestle in Malaysia. So it is very important to identify the very Nestle that we want to analyze so that you don't get confused. Let me give you an illustration of what I mean by that. Let's say if you go to a supermarket and if you see this, Australian Milo selling for $49.90. Wow, very good because I like the Australian Milo taste. I'm going to buy a can of Milo from this supermarket. And not just you, every other consumer thinks the same. So they are going to sapu everything from the shelf of this uh, Australian Milo. Now, the question is this. Even if you sapu every single can of Australian Milo from the shelf, it has zero profit impact to Nestle Malaysia Berhad. Why? Simply because this product is coming from Australia. It has got nothing to do with Nestle Malaysia. So therefore, you need to be very mindful of which Nestle products that you are talking about, which means to say, actually, this is what we want to be focusing on today which is the Malaysian version of Milo. If this one is selling like hotcakes, yes, this one is definitely going to make Nestle Malaysia a lot, a lot of money. So these are the six things that you need to know about Nestle Malaysia Berhad. Number one, they are the largest F&B producer in Malaysia, which consists of six factories and one distribution. And with the facilities that they have, they are able to produce 1,000 over products for their customers. And out of these 1,000 over products, interestingly, 500 of those products are actually halal, which makes them the largest halal producer in the Nestle world, right? This is very interesting because let's say, for example, a Middle Eastern country is trying to build their halal food supply chain. They don't need to worry so much of getting all those approval. They can just straight away import from Nestle Malaysia and immediately they can sell those halal products in those markets. Speaking about exports, actually about 20% of their products is exported to more than 50 countries around the world. So not just doing business in Malaysia, they are also exporting their goods overseas, which means to say Forex plays an important role in the P&L to see whether they actually make a gain or a loss for that particular quarter. And lastly, they also established the first PBMS in Southeast Asia. PBMS stands for Plant-Based Manufacturing Solutions. For those people who are vegetarian or they want to find meat alternative, Nestle has just come out with a new product which is plant-based that tastes like meat. Right, so if you don't like to eat beef, you can buy their new products going forward. So now that we have a better understanding about Nestle, what factors that make Nestle Malaysia a defensive stocks? Like what we have researched from Google just now, Google mentioned that there are two elements to look out for. One is from the earnings and the other one is a strong balance sheet. Now we are going to use the same approach to help us to understand if Nestle Malaysia is a defensive stock and if Nestle Malaysia is a stock for you as a defensive investor. This is a snapshot of their five-year revenue pulled out from their 2021 annual report. As you can see, year in, year out, their revenue is very steady. In fact, it has grown over the years despite all this COVID-19 pandemic and all that. But what I want to draw your attention is this part over here between FY17 and FY18. As you can see, there's a huge jump in revenue during this period of time. Now, what happened? If you can recall, right, in 2018, the government introduced a tax holiday, a GST tax holiday between June and August. Now, as a consumer, what would you do? After August, things are going to get more expensive because tax are kicking in. And we all know that the food and beverages that Nestle produce generally have a very long shelf life. You can keep your Milo for up to a year. You can buy Maggi and stock it up and you can use it for the rest of the year, for example. So therefore, of course, you tend to go and stock up more food products to enjoy this tax holiday. So during this FY17 to FY18, they experience this surge in terms of sales because there are a lot of consumer rushing to buy all these tax-free products. Logically speaking, after buying so many products and stock it up at home, you will not buy so much food anymore. Right? So technically speaking, FY19 revenue should be weaker. But look at what happened in 2019. It's roughly the same. It didn't drop at all. Well, it dropped a bit, but 
It's very small amount, right? And that shows the resilience of Nestle's revenue year in, year out. That is the first factor that we can conclude that Nestle Malaysia is a defensive stock. Of course, then moving forward in 2020, we all experienced COVID-19. You know, people are locked down, they spend less, they consume less. So obviously consumption also came down. That affected Nestle Malaysia sales. But even that also, it only dropped by a little bit. And a year after that, just look at this jump from 5.4 billion all the way up to 5.7 billion. What happened over here? First of all, between 2020 and 2021, we experienced the reopening of the economy after the COVID-19 lockdown. So a lot of people are starting to go out to enjoy their mama session with their friends again. They're going out to restaurants to consume again. And all these Nestle products, actually most of their sales is coming from out of home channels, which means to say that their revenue, apart from sales that is made of you go and buying Milo and keep it at home, it's also because of you going to mama and order a Milo ice or a Nescafe ice. That portion of sales contributes a large chunk of Nestle's Malaysia revenue. And because of that, the reopening of the Malaysian economy boosted Nestle Malaysia sales by substantial amount. Apart from that, it's also because Nestle Malaysia has come up with new product range, like I mentioned just now, the plant-based meal product. And also they've come up with a new tea range as well called Lively. So now the question is from 2021 to 2022, can this growth rate sustain or not? Then that brings us to another analysis here, which they produce in their investor relation page. This chart shows the revenue trend between 2021 and 2022 for the reported three quarters that has already been completed. As you can see, every quarter, they are consistently increasing their revenue by 17 to 18%. So which means if you draw a linear line across in FY 2022, the fourth quarter is very likely that they may actually register the same amount of growth as well for the last three months of the financial year. So that resiliency is what we want to find in a defensive stock because great revenue contributes to great profit and with great profit, it is able to generate great dividend back to shareholders. So what do you mean by great dividend? Of course, the more profit that is given back to shareholders is better, lah, right? So let's have a look at Nestle Malaysia to see how much dividend they're actually paying to their shareholders. By the way, I don't know how many of you know that I came from a corporate banking background and left my job to start this media business alongside Peter and CK. But I have to say that starting a business isn't easy as you need to think about cash flow management, business model, tax planning, and the list goes on and on. Rumor has it that 2023 won't be an easy fit economically, hence, as a business owner ourselves, we are organizing a physical event together with Next Up Asia and its largest entrepreneurs and startup community in Malaysia and Alliance Bank to help you in whatever ways possible in securing growth for your business. Check out this link to find out more and secure your seat now. Back to our video. According to their annual report, their earnings per share in FY 2021 is around 2 ringgit and 43 cents. And if you look at their dividend payout, right, which is over here, it is paying 2 ringgit and 42 cents, which means to say almost every ringgit that they earn is distributed back to shareholders as dividend. 100%. Where to find these kind of stocks, you tell me. When we talk about dividend, it is very important to understand this concept. Dividend is being paid out based on the net profit of a company. But a company that is making profit doesn't mean that it has cash. Maybe they are doing a lot of credit sales. Their customers are owing them a lot of money. In such situation, even when a company is making good profit, they are not able to give dividend to their shareholders. So when Nestle Malaysia is distributing 100% of their net profit back to investors as dividend, that means they must have a lot full of cash in order to give that commitment to their shareholders. So with that, just a quick highlight here to recap what I've mentioned just now, a dividend payout is based on the net income of the company. It's not based on the cash position that the company has, but the company must have cash in the first place in order to distribute dividends to investors. Speaking of cash, there is no other way than to look into their cash flow statement. So it's very interesting to look at their cash flow because from their operating activities, we can see that over the nine months in FY 2021, Nestle Malaysia has generated 385 million ringgit cold hard cash sitting in their bank account. And it is with this cash, they are able to pay out dividend 
that is worth 239 million ringgit. So that is where you are getting your money from. Now, the remaining of the cash, what they do is that they use part of it to do some investment. They have acquired some property, plant and equipment, which is around 169 million ringgit. They use it to pare down their debts a little bit and they can use it for a lot of financial obligation. Then the next question you will be asking, yes, they are making a lot of money. All this money are being redistributed back to their shareholders. Yes, they still have a little bit of residual, which they use to do some investments. But is that enough to provide growth for the company in order to generate sustainable earnings going forward? Remember the definition from Google of a defensive stocks? is sustainable, reliable earnings for a very long period of time. So apart from distributing dividends back to investors, Nestle Malaysia must also ensure that they have enough bullets to help them to grow going forward in order to create shareholders value for their investors. So in order to gear up their business, what they have done is that for FY 2021, they have a loan and borrowing standing of around 300 million ringgit. How do they use this money? Let's take a look. So in FY 2021, they have used roughly 275 million ringgit for these four major projects that is stated in their annual report. Most of it is being used to invest in their plant-based meal solution manufacturing line. Part of it is used to do expansion of Maggie manufacturing line. It's also to help them to renovate their new head office where they just shifted from the curve to Banda Utama. And on and off, they also need to replace those ice cream vending machines and those can drink vending machine that you see in supermarkets. In FY20, most of the capex of around 295 million is also used for roughly the same purpose. Most of it is used for plant-based meal solutions, Maggie manufacturing line, and for the renovation of their head office. What does it mean? It means that for the next two years ahead, we are going to see a lot of marketing and promotional campaigns to push all these new products to the market. So maybe going forward, Malaysia will start to have even more plant-based kind of restaurant pop-ups to offer that kind of offerings to their customers, right? And for those people who are vegetarian or want to look for meat alternative in their meal, then maybe you can watch out this space in the next one to two years when they are more ready to actually push these products out to the market. Why am I so sure about that? It's because if you look at one year earlier and you look at their capex plan, this is what happens. In FY19, Nestle has spent roughly around 183 million ringgit for four to five projects as well. What are these projects? These projects are to come up with new manufacturing in line for Oreo stick ice cream and Kit Kat stick ice cream, which I'm sure today, if you go to supermarket, you can find all these products on the shelf. And they have also expanded the Milo manufacturing line. And I am pretty sure that with the new ambassador from Korea on Malaysia, Milo, there's a chance that Malaysian Milo is actually exported to that country as well. So those expansion that was did in FY19 is being seen as an effect in FY 2022 and going forward 2023. So rest assured, 2023, all this growth may come from all this area whereby they have planted the seed back in 2019, about two to three years back. All in to give you a recap of what makes a good defensive stocks, I have summarized down into three assets that you need to be aware of. Number one, the company needs to make steady earnings. Number two, it must have a very steady cash flow. And number three, it must have very strong balance sheet so that it can continue to generate sustainable shareholder value to investors. Having said that, whatever that I've just said just now is not an investment advice. It is just merely an example to help you point out what makes a good defensive stocks. From there, you can use the same technique to help you to discover other defensive stocks in the market for your investment purposes. If you still have no clues of how to find your own defensive stocks, don't worry because in the next episode, I'm going to provide five more examples of all these stocks that can generate good sustainable income for 2023. If you want me to talk about any other investment team, please leave a comment below and we will pick it up and we can make it into a video for you in our future videos. With that, See you again next time.